All right, welcome back to the induction and recursion slides. Let's keep on trucking. So we only had a sneak peek of it last time. We talked about sequences and some special properties of sequences. Let's talk about some more kinds of sequences, because why not? So uh, two common types of sequences that exist in the wild are called geometric and arithmetic. Let's talk about each. So a geometric sequence is when you have a bunch of numbers and the next element in the sequence is based off of the previous one and you multiply it by some constant that remains uh, constant for the entire sequence, some r. And r is called the common ratio. Okay, so let's define an example geometric sequence. So let's say the first element is 1, and that's our a0. And then let's say that our r is equal to 2. So let's see what happens in that case. So that means to get to the next element, I need to multiply a0 times 2. Okay, so what is a0 times 2? That's what a1 needs to be, because that's my r. I guess, sorry, and the definition r is on the left, so 2 times a0, which equals the number 2. Okay, so that's a1. And then to get to this one, I need to again multiply it by 2, uh, and that'll give me 4, right? It's always times 2. This one will give me 8. It's another times 2. So r is used with the previous element of the sequence, so like 8. Multiply it by r, that gives us the next element in the sequence. So this is just all the powers of 2. 16, 32, 64, blah, blah, blah. That is a sequence. And uh, sequences, by the way, they can be either finite or infinite. They can end or they don't have to end. It doesn't matter. And geometric sequences can be either. Like this could be a sequence that just goes on forever, that goes through all the powers of 2. Or maybe we want it to stop at like 1024 or something. It's still a geometric sequence if it stops. Not a problem. Okay, so that is the first kind. Then we also have arithmetic sequences, which are almost exactly the same as geometric, only instead of multiplying by some constant, we're just adding some constant. Okay, so the next element in the sequence is the previous element plus some number. And uh, the number is called d which stands for the common difference. So like, how is it changing? What's the difference between those two elements of the sequence, all right? And so let's do, this is maybe a, an infinite sequence. Let's do a finite one now. Let's say that our initial element of this sequence, let's say it's the sequence B, and here is B0. B0 is two. And let's say that our D is also two. So how do I get B1? from b0, it's b1 is equal to b0 plus d, which is equal to 2 plus 2, oh man, that is 4. It's always plus 2. So b1 is plus 2, uh, and now b2, based on this, is plus 2 to 4, that's 6 now. This is 8. This is now 10. I hope that makes enough sense. Okay, so uh, this can be a finite sequence. Let's say we're done at 10, like this sequence has 5 elements. has five elements. That's a valid arithmetic sequence. Only five elements, but it's built in this special way. Every next element is based off of the previous one, plus some d value, some difference value, okay? So that is the last element. It goes up to, uh, starting at b0, it goes up to b4, and that's where it ends. b4 is the last element in the sequence, whereas this one has no end, has no last element an infinite sequence. So I think now that we've done a lot of these, remember to go back to the slide to discover what all these mean, uh, I would like you to try this. So given those terms that we just learned about in the last lecture, recall them and see if you can circle some of these properties to describe this sequence. So here's a sequence where a sub n, the nth element of the sequence, is equal to n squared minus 2n for some for all n greater than or equal to 1. So it starts at 1. Okay, so see if you can figure out if this is increasing, decreasing, non-increasing, or non-decreasing. What kind of sequence is it? All right, so uh, usually the best idea is to just do examples. What is, what is a1? What is a2? a3, a4. What are those? Let's, let's use this definition to find them. So a1 is 1 squared plus 2 times 1. That appears to be 
uh, oh sorry, minus two times one, excuse me. So that's one minus two, negative one. Then this one, next one is two squared minus two times two, which is zero. Okay, then this a three is now three squared minus two times three, which is nine minus six, that's three. And then a four is four squared minus two times four, so that's 16 minus eight is eight again. Okay, so that's the sequence. What is true about it? It looks like every element is definitely always getting strictly bigger than the next element, and I'm pretty sure that's going to continue for the rest of time. It looks like the difference is getting more drastic with every new element. I'm pretty sure we can conclude that successfully. So I think it's an increasing sequence. It's always getting strictly bigger, but, uh, so it's definitely not decreasing. It's never getting smaller. That's impossible. Uh, and it's definitely not non-increasing because it really is getting bigger. Uh, Another option, though, a weaker form of increasing is non-decreasing. So if it's ever increasing, it's also non-decreasing, right? Because it's not getting smaller. Non-decreasing is this one. The next element is less than or equal to, OK? So it also is less than or equal to whenever it is strictly less than. So it's also non-decreasing. And that's the only two, OK? Hopefully you got that. With that, let us talk about cooler ways to define sequences, okay? So here is a sequence uh, defined in a special way. It's called a recurrence relation. That tells us how to define the next element based on something involving previous elements, maybe more than one, okay? So recurrence relations are relations or sequences where you can figure out the next element in that sequence, a n, based on previous elements, just some way. It doesn't have to be the same way, but there's a function involved here. Okay, so here is a very nice sequence that is a recurrence relation. So a Fibonacci, the Fibonacci sequence is secretly a recurrence relation because if you give those two starting elements, f0 and f1, as your little base cases, then the next element, fn, is always equal to fn minus 1 plus fn minus 2. It's a function of the previous terms. Isn't that so cool? That is what it means to be a recurrence relation. So you can use the previous elements in a certain way with a rule to get at the next element. So 0, 1, 0, and 1 give you the 1. You add them together. 1 and 1 give you the 2. You add them together. 1 and 2 give you the 3. You add them together. Isn't that neat? Then 5, then 8. This is a rule to make the sequence. It's called a recurrence relation. It doesn't fit any of the geometric or arithmetic sequence definitions. It's a bit more general, but still cool. All right. In fact, you can use recurrence relations. Those are strictly more powerful than those. You can define arithmetic and geometric sequences as recurrence relations. You just got to give initial values, like a0 is something. And then the next element, every future element, is well that previous element plus the difference for an arithmetic sequence, and uh, it's that previous element times some ratio uh, for a geometric sequence. So recurrence relations, relations are more powerful ways than arithmetic and geometric sequences. Uh, they are new ways to define fancier sequences. Okay. So let's get some example. Uh, some examples with that. Let's have some practice with recurrence relations. Here is a recurrence relation. B1 is 0, that's the first element of the sequence called B. B2 is 3, and Bn is equal to this, Bn minus 1 minus 7 times Bn minus 2 for all the n's greater than or equal to 3. So it's an infinite sequence, and it's built up in this way. See if you can write the first six terms of this sequence, please. Okay? So give that a try and then I'll come back and do it with you. Here we go. So it's very easy to give the first two terms because they're given, right? So definitely it goes like this, 1, 3. And then what is this one? We need to calculate the next element in the sequence, b, this is b, sorry, b1, b2. b3 is equal to b2 minus 7 times b1. 
So that's 3 minus 7 times 1, which is negative 4. Okay. Cool. And then, so that's B3. Then B4 is based on the previous two. It's equal to whatever this is. It's equal to 1 ago, negative 4, minus 7 times 2 ago, which is negative 3. No, sorry, positive 3. So that's negative 4 minus 21. Uh, that's 20, negative 25? Yeah, negative 25. Oh man, these are getting large. Uh, but OK. And then this one, this one next after that is uh, whatever it is, it's equal to the previous one, negative 25, minus 7 times two previous elements ago, negative 4. What? So that's negative 25 plus 7, 14, 20, or 28. Negative 25 plus 28. That's positive 3. This is a, this sequence is oscillating. That's kind of cool. It went back to negative 3. Or, sorry, it went back to positive 3. Don't know why I want to keep saying negative things. And that's cool. Let's see what happens for the next element. We just need one more, right? Whatever this is, it's equal to one element ago, so 3 minus 7 times negative 25. OK, which is equal to, well, 4 is 100. 3 more is 125, or 175, right? 175 plus 3. So that is 100, 3 plus 175, which is 178. I do believe that is correct. So those are the first six terms of the sequence. Just using those rules, getting practice with recurrence relations. OK. Let's move on to summations now, which I assume you've also seen in a math class before. Summations are nice when you have a bunch of elements and you just want to talk about I want talk about the idea of adding some of those elements, maybe all of them, okay? It just makes it easy to talk about the sum of terms in a sequence. That's why uh, we use a large sigma element in Greek. Sigma is there is the Greek s, s for sum. Okay? So Let's pretend we have this sequence, a1, a2, it's got some elements, a, s, s plus 1, s plus 2, all the way to t, a, t. And we care about summing all the elements between a, s, and a, t, so part of that sequence, just from here to here. That's all that we want to sum together, those elements. We want to figure out what that sum is. Or we want to give a math problem to somebody. Find that sum for me, please. Instead of saying this, because you can totally write it like this, a s plus a s plus 1 plus a s plus 2 plus ellipses plus a t, that gets the point across. You can also, in a more compact form, write this. And let me show you how to read it. It's the summation, and you have like an iteration variable. That's where these come from. Math came first. Uh, with a starting variable, or a starting value for i. So start. So i starts at s, and it ends at t inclusive. It goes until t, including t. And it means sum all of the ai's. So i gets to start at s, and it goes until t. Try all those, please. That's what it means. Try as, add it to as plus 1 plus as plus 2 plus all those up until a t. That is a summation. That's a nicer way of talking about it. Okay, so i is called the index, s is the lower limit, t is the upper limit. It is really legitimately a mathematical for loop. This is kind of where we're getting all of our notation with uh, or from in computer science when we have those kinds of loops. Isn't that cool? So yeah, a little bit of a history lesson, I guess. And here are some examples. Let's write using summation notation, the sum of all the numbers from 2 to 55. So that's 2 plus 3 plus dot dot dot, all the way to 54 plus 55. Compactly, we can write that as a summation. Please sum all the numbers. We don't have to use i. We can use j. j can start at 2 and go until 55 and just sum all the j's. Do you see how that represents this idea? all the numbers from 2 to 55, sum them all together. And you can very easily change summa summations as well. Something that's going to come up later is being able to pull out terms, like the start or end term of a summation. So let's pull out the 2 from this summation 
And so we want it to be 2 plus the rest. 2 plus the 3 plus dot 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 plus 54 plus 55. How do we do that? Well, just bring out the 2 and then represent this sum as a summation, which really only involves changing that lower limit. 2 plus the summation of j starting at 3, j equals 3, all the way to 55 of j again. Okay, so that's us pulling out the 2. I hope you see that. Not too bad, right? So that's summation notation. And uh, sometimes we can even do better than that. We don't even need summations to express a sum because there are things called closed forms, all right? And let me show you some of them. So the closed form for the sum of terms in an arithmetic sequence, for example, is this. If you sum together all the k's, oops, all the numbers from k equals 0 to n minus 1 of a plus kd, because that's going to give you elements in a arithmetic sequence, starting when k is 0, it's just a. When a is 1, it's a plus a single d. When k is 2, it's a plus two d's. It's going to give you an arithmetic sequence, increasing by uh, d each time. Okay. The closed form for that, the final number that that summation equals, is this, a n times, or a n plus d times n minus 1 times n over 2. That is totally a thing, okay? Let me kind of prove this to you. Let me show you the case where a is 1, d is 1, and n is 5, just to get the point across in case you've never seen this kind of proof before. It's a fun one. So let's say k equals 0 and n is 5, so up to 4 of 1, because that's a plus kd. Uh, d is just 1, so plus k. So that's our summation. That is equal to the sum of, uh, well, k equals 0. What's this? 1 plus 0, 1. Plus k equals 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus k is now 4, 1 plus k is 5. So it's just the sum from 1 to 5 if you talk about it that way. This is k equals 0, k equals 1, hopefully that makes sense. And so the trick to find this, find the closed form for this, is to take this entire summation and flip it around so you add it to itself. 5 plus 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1. And that's going to make it easier to find the closed form. So I have just added a second copy of that sequence. Not a problem, we'll get rid of it later. But look at what happens when I overlap those elements. Every single one of them is 6. Isn't that cool? So this becomes this. It becomes 6 plus 6 plus 6 plus 6 plus 6. And then because I double counted, I added the sequence to itself. Well, I just got to divide by 2, and that's the answer. Isn't that cool? So it's really. Uh, 5 times 6 over 2. All right, that is 15. That's the sum. And so instead of doing all that, you could have used this, this proof. It's equal to a times n, a is 1, n is 5, so 5, plus uh, d times n minus 1 times n, d is 1, so just uh, 4 times 5 over 2. And so this is a more general formula, but uh, it's still going to give you the answer of 15, because it's 5 plus 20 over 2, 10 equals 15. All right, so that is uh, the right answer. I hope that makes enough sense to you. So that is this closed form. It's nice to have. There's also a closed form that exists for geometric sequences. All right, so if you have this geometric sequence, you want to sum together all these elements of a geometric sequence where it's just your starting element times your ratio to some power, because that's going to give you, for higher powers, future elements based on the initial value of a. This is the closed form, OK? It's that fraction. So let me prove this summation uh, closed form to you for a equals 1, r equals 2, and n equals 4. All right. So that's going to make this summation sum of k equals 0 to uh, n minus 1, which is, I guess, do I want to go to, four or do I want to go to five? Um, I guess I want to go to four, so that, let's, let's make n five. <laughs> OK, 
because that's what I have in my notes. Let's do that example instead. Boop. And then I want to do uh, a is 1 and then r is 2, so 2 to the k. So add a bunch of multiples, uh, add a bunch of powers of 2, okay? So that's going to give me like 2 to the 0 plus 2 to the 1 plus 2 to the 2 plus 2 to the 3 plus 2 to the 4, that's the last one, okay? And let's call that the sum that we want, let's call that S, capital S, okay? Now the trick to understand how this works out, like why division by that makes any sense at all, let's multiply this entire sequence by our r, our value of r, which is 2, okay? So r times that entire sequence, it could be infinite, doesn't really matter, uh, is, well, just 2 times that plus 2 times that plus 2 times that, it distributes, right? Because r is 2, so that's 2 to the 1 plus 2 squared plus 2 cubed plus 2 to the 4th. Is that the right number of times? I don't think so. Then we also have 2 to the 5th. Let me make this smaller. 2 cubed plus, let me line them up, plus 2 to the 5th now. So it's just one bigger in every spot. And we also line these up and we calculate this value. We calculate R S minus the original S. And look what happens. Subtract, take this, subtract this from it. Look at what cancels. Those cancel, those cancel, those cancel, those cancel. That's nice. And that just gives us 2 to the 5 minus 2 to the 0. That's a much easier number to work with. And, uh, well, what do we need back? Let's, let's try and solve for the original S, right? So we can take out the S here. We can be like S uh, times R minus 1 equals 2 to the 5 minus 2 to the 0. And this is where you end up dividing by R minus 1. That's where that comes from, OK? So just take this, divide by r minus 1, which is just 1 in our case, and you end up with the right answer, OK? So that's kind of how this closed form happens. It's a bit of a hand-wavy proof, but hopefully you can see the strategy now. And these are very helpful uh, time savers for you, OK? So uh, yeah, I think that's all that I wanted to show you there. Um, I don't think I need this anymore. Cool. So now, let me give you something to try. Try to express this sum here using summation notation, the sum of the squares of the odd integers between 0 and 100. Kind of think about how you would write a for loop to go through all those values and kind of translate it to summation notation. That's, as a programmer, maybe the best route. So give that a try, and then we'll talk about it. OK. So we want to find a sum. We would like to sum the squares of the odd integers between 0 and 100. All right, so it sounds like I need a way of generating odd numbers, first of all. i starts at who knows what and goes till who knows what. We'll figure that out later. We need a value, we need a way of going through just the odd numbers like 1, 3, 5, because then we'll do stuff with them. How do we get 1, 3, 5, 7, 9? That is an arithmetic sequence. So we can use that. It's going to look something like this. So how do we get all the odd numbers? Well, it starts at 1, and then we add 2 times i. Does that make sense? So when i is 0, that's a starting value. When i is 0, this quantity is just 1. When i becomes 1, it becomes 1 plus 2, 3. When i is 2, it becomes 1 plus 4. Cool, that's 5. That's going to go in that form, 1, 5, 7, 9, all the way until, I guess we want all the odd integers between 0 and 100. 100 isn't even odd, so let's go up until 99, which is going to make this need to be, I'm pretty sure it's 49. OK? Because if it were 50, that would be 101. We don't want to get there, so go only up to 49, please. And that will give, this is right now the sum of all the odd integers. OK, I hope you see that. So this makes the odd numbers, this part right here. Then 
the rest is now we need to uh, just square them, right? Some of the squares of the odd integers. So there you go. See that? So here we found all the odd numbers, square them, add them together between 0 and 100. Kind of like a for loop. Cool, huh? So that is the answer. Hopefully you got that. Please yell at me if you have any questions about it. All right, let's see where we're going. Check our time. The next thing that I would like to talk about is a concept called mathematical induction. OK, let's talk about it. The first thing I'd like to do is motivate it, just in general. Uh, the goal, we have sequences. We've talked about those. We would like to prove properties about every element of the sequence, like something is true about this sequence. OK, so uh, we can actually prove a lot of stuff about sequences using our for all proof methods. Like here's the property that we want to prove. We know how to prove a for all for a lot of ways. Uh, but there is a very, very powerful way of proving a for all that we have not yet learned. OK, so uh, it's fun. All right, let's let me try and uh, show you what's going on here. So here's an example of a false theorem, by the way just to show you that it's not always the case where trying a few terms works, right? If it's a for all, you got to try everybody. Let me show you this. Here's a false theorem. For all n, n squared plus n plus 41 is prime, apparently. That's a false theorem. And let's figure out why by going to racket. We'll try a few examples. We need math slash number theory, and that will uh, give us is prime. Let's take a look at this. So here is my program. I have written it to do exactly what we were talking about. Take this n, try all of them for, for a certain range, and output the value of this sequence element and see if it was prime or not. So that's what prime question mark gives you back in Racket. Let's take a look at this. So bam, here are all the first, I don't know, 19 elements of the sequence, I guess goes from a1 to a19. Maybe I should have said 21 and then 41. Could have gone up to 20. That's fine. But look at this. It looks like this formula is really making only prime numbers. It's true. It's true. It's true. It's always prime, even up till the 19th element of the sequence, even the 20th element of the sequence. Does that mean it's true for every n? No, we need a powerful way of proving that it either is or is not. Uh, we don't have it quite yet. But let me show you this. Oops, 41. This theorem is false only because of the 40th element. Uh, and then it starts being false more often. But you have to try so many terms. It might look like this is a true theorem, and it like enumerates over only uh, prime numbers. But no, eventually it finds a number that is not prime. Uh, it generates a number that is not prime. and so. It is wrong to just try a bunch of examples because sometimes, like a lot of the time, it might work and you might be uh, led down the wrong path. Okay, so that we need something more powerful. We can't just trust a couple of examples in a for all proof. We have to somehow really prove once and for all that something is true. Okay, here is a powerful way of doing that. It's called mathematical induction and it is super cool. Okay, it's one of my uh, favorite things to teach in this class. So let us begin. So the goal of mathematical induction is we want to prove a property of uh, natural numbers. Okay, we want to prove something uh, called p, p of n, is true for every natural number. p of 0 is true, p of 1 is true, p of 2 is true. We want to prove that predicate true for every possible natural number. And mathematical induction gives us a new way to try this and make it happen, OK? It kind of involves a recursive idea. And we'll talk about the difference between induction and recursion in just a little bit. But here is the idea. The principle of mathematical induction uh, is defined to do this. This is how you do it. p of n is true for all the natural numbers. And if p0 is true, that's called the base case. Oh, you've heard that term before. and you need both of these at the same time. p of 0 must be true. And then for all k in the natural numbers, for every natural number k, p of k implies p of k plus 1. So starting at p of k, you can get implication error, right? You can get at p of k plus 1. You can use this previous proof to prove the next bigger case. Okay, So that is mathematical induction. And let 
us talk about it. Why in the world does that make sense? Why does that prove that a predicate's true for every possible natural number? Uh, that seems like it doesn't make enough sense to us, right? So let's figure this out. If you have the base case, if you if you prove this, then you know that p of 0 is true. You have that to work with. And then if you have proven this somehow, if you know that this is true, what does that give you? Well, that means I can use, uh, that means for every natural number, if I have this, if this, then that. If I have p of k, then I can get at p of k plus 1. I can get a proof for it. So, oh, I have p of 0. I can use that and get p of 1. I can make k 0 and run this rule. Do you see that? And that leads to a chain reaction that will give you the proof for every possible natural number. It's very powerful, very cool. So p of 0, once you have that, the chain unwinds. It keeps going forever. P of 0 gives you P of 1, then you can use P of 1 with this rule, this inductive step is what it's called, to give you the next proof for P of 2. And then you can use P of 2, set K to 2, to give you P of 3. Use P of 3 to get P of 4. And so on for the end of time. That's going to give you P of whatever for every single natural number. Isn't that nice? So, yeah. You just somehow have to, in addition to the base case, which sounds kind of normal, prove something about all natural numbers, like this implies this. That's a weird idea, but it's possible, okay? So in that inductive step, which is definitely the harder part, you have to prove that p of k implies p of k plus 1, which, if you think about it for a little while, it's just a direct proof. Interesting. You just get to assume p of k is true, and you must then prove p of k plus 1 is true. That will give you this very powerful chain reaction to prove p of n for every possible natural number, okay? You assume p of k is true in your proof, and you prove p, plus, p of k plus 1 is true. And because that's your, your assumption, uh, also called a hypothesis, p of k and these inductive proofs are called, uh, it, it's called the inductive hypothesis. We're going to use the inductive hypothesis to prove that the next bigger element uh, holds, okay? So let's talk about this. Uh, also, just as an aside, your book starts n at 1 and proves things for all positive numbers, but this is the way that I learned it, and we're computer scientists, so we're going to start at 0, okay? There is no difference, though. So let me show you mathematical induction, okay? Let me give you an example of it. It's going to take a lot of examples, so just uh, understand that, all right? So here's the theorem. For all n greater than or equal to 1, this summation is true. That's that simple case that I've been talking about. So uh, this is the theorem. For all n greater than or equal to 1, this summation is equal to this closed form. Now, we have to figure out, if we want to use mathematical induction, we have to figure out what is the predicate we're trying to prove for a certain n. Let's figure that out. It's this, right? This is the statement. If n changes, it's something about a new different n. Okay, so for all n greater than or equal to 1, this is true. That's my predicate on an n. Okay. And then we have to figure out, okay, what's the base case, what's the inductive step, and then we'll prove that, okay? So if we go back here, the base case is p of 0, that's easy. Let's just list it, we haven't proven them yet, let's just list what we have to prove. If we wanted to prove the base case, we have to show uh, the very first element is true. So it looks like these el elements start at 1, oops. So let's, uh, let's set that into this statement. So the base case is going to be prove p of 1 is that will lead to that chain reaction. Okay, p of 1 is equal to, just fill in here, that's equal to j equals 1 to 1 of j. That needs to be equal to, you have to prove that it's equal to uh, 1 times 1 plus 1 over 2. Okay, so that needs to be the first thing. That's the first step. And uh, then the inductive step. is always p of k, you got to prove that for all k, p of k implies p of k plus 1, okay? And that's what needs to happen. So uh, now let's prove it. Are you ready? So uh, this first base case is super easy. Let's do that first. We just have to show that p of 1 holds, that this is an equality. So let's do the left side. It's all the j's from 1 to 1. Well, there's just one j, uh, sum of all of those. That's just 1. Show that that is equal to uh, 1 times uh, 1 plus 1 over 2. So that's 2 over 2 times 1. That's just 1. 
oh, those are equal. That's the base case proven. Now we have to prove the inductive step, which in involves this, right? Assume p of k is true. Then what does that mean? That means So uh, if we assume that p of k is true, we assume that the sum of, we just plug in k, we get to assume that from j plus 1 to k, the sum of all those j's is equal to k times k plus 1 over 2. That's an assumption we get to make. This is called our inductive hypothesis, or IH for short. Okay, and then we need to use that to prove, to show, p of k plus 1, okay, which is equal to this. I don't know if there's enough room. Uh, it's just, all right, show that for all the j's from 1 to k plus 1, that better be equal to uh, k plus 1 times k plus 2 over 2. Okay, that's what we need to show. Uh, so assume this, use it to prove this, and then we will have proven it for every possible n because of mathematical induction. It lets us chain together all those operations and make the proof true, make it hold for every possible element. Okay, so let's uh, let's keep going. Let's let's talk about that. So let's rewrite our inductive hypothesis. That is our I H. I'm just gonna just going to rewrite it then. So our inductive hypothesis, the thing that we're assuming is the sum of all that j equals 1 to k of j is equal to k times k plus 1 over 2. And then to show, what we need to show now, that's our assumption, p of k, to show that's our p of k plus 1. We need to show that the sum of j equals 1 to k plus 1, because we're just plugging in k plus 1 here. The sum of all those j's is equal to k plus 1 times k plus 2 over 2. So now that we have room, let's make this happen. Okay, so assuming this, let's use it to prove this. All right, so let's, let's try and make some progress here. What is the sum of all the j's from j equals 1 to k plus 1. Can we see this? Can we use this somehow to figure out this answer? Do you see it? This is almost looking like that. There's just a k plus 1 there instead of a k. What if we take out the k plus 1 term? That means it's equal to, the summation is the same as, well, just do up to k, and then do the k plus 1 term too, because you still have to add that. So that's plus. If we went up to k plus 1, it would be plus k plus 1, right? That's the one extra thing, so plus k plus 1. And that's quite nice, because now these match. I can replace that with this, because I'm assuming that this inductive hypothesis is true. I'm assuming that p of k is true. I'm using it to prove this. So that means uh, this is equal to this side. k times, not plus, sorry, k times k plus 1 over 2 plus that additional k plus 1, okay? Now, we can put all these in the same spot, right? Because eventually we need to get this looking like this. Let's get a common denominator. Let's get uh, k times k plus 1 over 2 plus uh, 2 times k plus 1, right, over 2. That's equivalent. And then this simplifies to be, uh, let's see here. How many k plus 1s? k plus 1. We can factor that out. So here's a k plus 1. Here's k of them. Here's 2 of them. So the total number of k plus 1s is k plus 2 all over 2. And uh, that was actually exactly what we needed to show. This side equal to this side. That's what we needed. We did it. QED. 
this is a true statement. This is a true theorem. For all n greater than or equal to 1, that closed form holds. Isn't that neat? So yeah, we just proved that summation by induction. We assumed, we proved the base case so that we could start off, and then we proved the inductive step, which gave us a way to get at bigger values. We got the proof for bigger values of n so that it works for all of them now. That's pretty nice. So again, it's going to take a lot of examples to let this sink in. Let me check our time. Uh, and that is my job. I'm going to give you a bunch of examples now. So let's do something a bit simpler than that last theorem. Let's define the natural numbers with induction. Okay. So you can make an inductive definition in addition to an in inductive proof. The, the strategy is similar. Okay. Here's how you define, here's one way to define what the natural numbers are, which is it's supposed to be 0, 1, 2, all the way on forever. right? So let's define those. Start with a set. Let's say, start with a set containing just 0. Here's the process. Until the end of time, so forever and ever, take the largest element in s and add that number plus 1 to s. If you do that until the end of time, for infinite time, you will end up with s equaling n. That is one way to actually define the natural numbers. So you start with s at, uh, holding just 0. And then you continuously add, take the biggest number out, it's just 0 right now, and add in 1 plus that number. So s is now 0 and 1. Then you find the biggest number, and then you add in it plus 1. S is going to add with 2 in it now. S equals 0, 1, 2. And do you see how this is going to build up? If you do this forever, it will build up the natural number set. Isn't that cool? So this is called an inductive definition, and it's how the natural numbers are defined. So if I said the word inductive, there needs to be a base case and an inductive step. Here's how you do it. The base case for defining the natural numbers is, we say, oh, 0 is a natural number. And that starts off, that kicks off the induction that builds up the set. Okay? And the inductive step, I hope you see how this is building the natural numbers. It's kind of logical, right? Inductive step. If n is in the natural numbers, then n plus 1, put that in it too. n plus 1 should also be in the natural numbers. See how that's going to build up this idea? build up a bigger and bigger set that really is the natural numbers. Starts at 0, adds 1, adds 2, adds 3. That's what the inductive step does. It worries about adding another element. So that is a way to use induction to define something. That's totally possible. And yeah, I want to make sure we're OK on time before I get into, into this next example, because it's a, it's a longer one. It might take two, two tries. But let's start it out at least right now. And we're going to notice a problem. And I think maybe it's best to fix it next time. OK, but here is my fun little example uh, that I stole from MIT. It's a fun one. OK, so uh, it's about L-shaped tiles and like drawing pretty pictures. So here is the problem. OK, here's a problem that we would like to solve. Let's pretend that uh, Fresno State is, oops, my tablet is not recognized. Let's pretend that Fresno State, uh, they got some mad scientist and He's experimenting with a really cool new type of corn that grows only in an L shape. Okay, so it could be a reversed L, not a problem. It just looks like this, uh, that kind of shape. Okay, and uh, they would like to use, like they've set aside a 2n by 2n plot of squares to grow the corn in, and they also want to make sure after they have filled in this plot with corn, that there is one square left over somewhere in the middle. There's going to be four options for the middle, but that's close enough to the middle. There's one square left over in the middle to put a big sprinkler, because that's a good place to put one, right? So what we'd like to do is prove this theorem for all sizes of plots, for all n in the natural numbers. There is a way to tile, that is fill in, this 2n by 2n plot with that L-shaped corn while leaving out a 1 by 1 square in the center. And here's one possible tiling to show you that it is possible for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 by 8. Okay. Does this make sense? That is the problem statement. This is uh, 2, 2, 4, 6, 8. 2 to the 4 by 2 to the 4. 
This is 2 to the 1 by 2 to the 1. It's a single L-shaped L -shaped tile of corn. And it can be in any orientation. You just got to fill them all in like this and leave room in the middle somewhere for a sprinkler. Okay? And so we'd like to prove that no matter the size of plot, as long as it's 2n by 2n, for some n, there's a way to fill it in uh, with corn and a sprinkler in the middle. Okay? So let's try and prove this by induction, which is going to let us use smaller plots to build the proof for the bigger plot. Okay, and it's going to be a uh, it's going to be a fun diagrammatic proof. Okay, so here is proof round one because it's not going to work. There's going to be a problem. Okay, so here's our theorem again for all n and n. Uh, we want to prove that there's a way to fill in that two n by two n plot with our corn, leaving out a one by one square in the center. Let's try to prove that using induction. Okay which means we need to find our predicate for all n and n, something is true. Here is the something, right? It's all of this from here to here. That's P of n. Right? So for a given n, there's a way to fill in a plot of that size with corn, leaving a one by one square, just a single square in the center. Okay, so uh, what is our base case? What is our inductive step? So our base case, uh, it can be n equals zero. That's totally fine. So we need to prove p of 0 is true. And then we need to prove our inductive step. And then it'll be true for any n. You give me a giant plot of 2n by 2n corn, I will grow it and leave room for a sprinkler. So uh, p of k will give us p of k plus 1. So if p of k, then p of k plus 1. Okay. So we need to assume this. And we need to show this. All right, so let's prove the base case. This is quite easy. What's p of 0? That means there's a way to fill in a 2 to the 0 by 2 to the 0 plot with L-shaped corn while leaving out a square in the center. What's 2 to the 0 by 2 to the 0? Uh, that's just 1 by 1. That is a 1 by 1 plot of land to fill in with corn uh, while leaving a square in the middle for water, for a sprinkler. Well, just uh, there is no room for corn. Just put a single sprinkler, and you've, you've done it, right? You can... it's totally valid to use no uh, corn, and we've still left out room in the center for a sprinkler, so we've just proven the base case. I hope that makes enough sense. Totally fine. Uh, if that doesn't work well enough for you, you can say that n starts at 1, and obviously it works. Okay, So that is fine. And then the next step is to use that idea of filling in a smaller plot to make a bigger one. Okay, So we need to assume Assume p of k. Assume, what is p of k? That means we can tile a 2 to the k by 2 to the, eight to the k plot, right? 2 to the k by 2 to the k. That's a long word. Assume we can, we can tile a 2 to the k by 2 to the k plot. We know how to do that. Then we need to tile, we need to show that we can tile based on that idea, based on this knowledge of how to do that for a smaller plot, we need to show that we can always tile a 2 to the k plus 1 by, it's supposed to be a 1, 2 to the k plus 1 by 2 to the k plus 1 plot. Okay? And here is the graphical proof. It's fun. So what is a 2 to the k plus 1 plot but this. Let's say that this is 2 to the k plus 1, and this is also 2 to the k plus 1. Well, uh, it's just, it could be this. It is four separate 2 to the k plots, isn't it? Because this can be 2 to the k, there's two of them, it makes 2 to the k plus 1. Add them together, multiply by 2. Here's a 2 to the k plot. Here's a 2 to the k plot. These are all 2 to the k plots, and they're building up a bigger 2 to the k plus 1 plot. Do you see how we can use this to prove this maybe now? Okay. So if we use our inductive hypothesis saying that we know how to tile each of these individual 2 to the k plots with corn such that we leave out, like in a special way, we use the tiles, and we left out room in the middle for a sprinkler, like here's our little sprinkler. Uh, do I want to 
maybe I want to use a different color. Like we know how to tile this one, we know how to tile this one, we know how to tile this one. There's a way, we know how, we get to assume we do, to leave out room in the middle for that sprinkler. Whee! Room in the middle, room in the middle, room in the middle, room in the middle. We need to somehow prove, based on that knowledge, that we can then go and find room in the middle, uh, one of these, so maybe like here, we need to find room for a sprinkler there and like fill these in with corn because we, we want the sprinkler in the middle, right? So this is, this is what the inductive hypothesis gives us, this knowledge, knowledge of how to do this. It's a very generic idea. It doesn't have to be just about math, inductive uh, proofs. We need something here. And based on these, like that's nowhere near, that, those sprinklers for those smaller plots are nowhere near the middle, the middle of the bigger plot. So this is really sad. That kind of ruins our proof. We cannot right now, with this knowledge, with this inductive hypothesis, assuming that, prove that we can build a bigger plot and actually fill it in properly and water it with a sprinkler in the middle. So that just means something is wrong with our proof, okay? Something is wrong with our inductive hypothesis. It's not giving us enough to prove P of K plus one. Sad day. Sometimes that happens. So the trick is to what's called strengthen our inductive hypothesis. And the new theorem that we're going to prove is for all n, there's a way to tile a 2n by 2n plot with L-shaped corn while leaving out a 1 by 1 square, not in the middle, but anywhere we would like. And if we assume that, we could leave out room right here, right here, right here, right here, and put a new L and some sprinklers and I'm going to prove that to you next time. Okay, so I'll see you then. Uh, the next thing that I'm about to do is record a video for your next lab. So please go and watch that. Oh wait, no, we have to talk about your next midterm because it is week 10 and you have a test coming up during week 12. Sorry, let us just go over that briefly and that'll be the final word that I say in the lecture. So uh, I'll release the midterm 2 info page to you and also the extra credit assignment to you. Don't worry about this date, I still have to fix it, but the extra credit one is correct. So let's make this larger and white. So uh, it's going to be very similar to the previous midterm. Midterm 2 will be on Canvas. Uh, week 12, this is now going to be Thursday and Friday because we don't have to have a pesky Friday holiday on that week. So the 31st is a Thursday and the 1st is a Friday. So you have even more time. Uh, in the week to take it. So you can take it later in the week. Okay, so it'll become available on March 31st. That's the Thursday and be available until April 1st at 8.30 p.m. That's the Friday. So hopefully that works out for you and it's going to be hour and 30 minutes as usual. Here are the chapters and homeworks and stuff that I'm going to be taking the test out of and uh, this time, in addition to multiple choice questions, there will also be some short answer questions. There's some stuff that I can ask you now uh, that makes sense for those kinds of questions. And here's a sample midterm. So give that a try and uh, ask me about it if you have any questions. But that's your midterm two. It's going to happen in week 12, the Thursday and the Friday. Okay, you can take it on either of those days. And then also the extra credit assignment. Let's talk about that. If you would like, you can make a midterm two review video. So same uh, requirements as last time. Again, up to 2.5% extra credit. I don't think I have to say any more. You know it from the last time I went over this. So it's the same idea. It's gonna be due the midnight of the day before the test comes out. So midnight on March 30th. And uh, that'll be that. So get the extra credit assignment in by then if you would like to do it. And that is uh, all that I want to say right now about your midterm. So that is officially the end of the lecture. I will now see you in the lab video.